Hello, and welcome to our financial aid presentation. By watching this recording, we are confident that you will have the information you need to guide you and your family through the 24-25 financial aid process. My name is Abby Langner. I'm a financial aid advisor for Baker College. Although this is a recorded presentation, the Baker College financial aid advisors are always willing to assist you with your application questions. After watching this video, feel free to reach out to us via email at financialaid@baker.edu or phone at 989-729-3911. During this presentation, I will cover a financial aid overview where we will discuss the various terms and processes of financial aid. Then we'll move on to discuss the FAFSA and its requirements. And then I will finish up with scenarios on how to use this information at a college. There are slides in this presentation for you to find a certain section. So please feel free to skip ahead at any time for the information that you need. First things first, let's discuss what financial aid is. Financial aid refers to any funds a student uses to help pay for college. While we often think of scholarships and grants or free money as financial aid, there's also another side which includes loans and work study. You may often hear the items on the top, scholarships and grants, referred to as gift aid because they are seen as a payment which does not need to be repaid a gift for your education, so to say. While the items on the bottom, loans and work study, are referred to as self-help aid because they require the student to either pay back the funds or participate in a job like with the federal work study. All of these resources come together to make a student's financial aid package offer. It's important to note that not all financial aid has the same requirements or processes. For example, you may be asked to complete an essay application for a scholarship, whereas for Pell Grants, you just have to complete the FAFSA application to see if you qualify. We will get further into these details later in the presentation, but it is helpful to know what options you have when you begin this process. We will begin by going over grants. Typically, grants are funds which are awarded based on need-based criteria and may not need a separate application. There are several different grants available through the FAFSA. The largest grant program is the Federal Pell Grant. The Pell Grant uses a calculation based on the individual's FAFSA data, which we will discuss later in the presentation. While we don't know the Pell amounts for the 24-25 school year, in the 23-24 school year, awards ranged from $767 to the maximum of $7,395. In addition to the federal Pell Grant, there's also the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, or FSEOG. Each college establishes policies for awarding FSEOG, so the amount you receive at one college may differ from another. The state of Michigan also has a grant pro program called the Michigan Tuition Grant. The Michigan Tuition Grant, or MTG, is only available at private colleges such as Baker College. MTG is awarded to Michigan residents who complete a FAFSA by May 1st and are attending a private college in the state of Michigan. While MTG is always dependent on the state's budget, we are anticipating an award of $3,000 for each eligible student for the 23-24 academic year. The state of Michigan also funds the Tuition Incentive Program, or TIP, Students gain TIP eligibility based on Medicaid eligibility. For more information on TIP, visit the michigan.gov forward slash MI student aid website. It is important to note that TIP eligible students must certify eligibility prior to their high school graduation. The most popular option that is discussed under financial aid is scholarships. Most scholarships are based on merit or other criteria. You may have to write an essay or complete an application to be considered. Some scholarships may come from an institution you attend, such as the ones we offer new students here at Baker. For high school seniors, we have scholarships for a wide range of GPAs. Something that you don't see at every school that Baker does is offer scholarships for graduate students. 
And we also offer scholarships for those transferring from another school or those who may be returning to school. I encourage you all to take a look at the scholarships page on our website for the most up-to-date. You can find them at baker.edu forward slash scholarships. It is a good rule of thumb to make sure you're talking with the colleges you're considering to see what type of scholarships opportunities they have and see what's available and what needs to be done in order to receive these scholarships. Start those conversations now as some scholarships may have deadlines. Looking at the state of Michigan, the state of Michigan also offers scholarships to students who apply for the FAFSA and meet the application priority deadline of May 1st. On this slide, I have highlighted the Michigan Achievement Scholarship, which is new for recent Michigan high school graduates who meet the requirements. There is no priority deadline for this scholarship. With other uh, Michigan programs, however, there can be a priority deadline of May 1st, so I want you to make sure you get those FAFSAs completed before then to be eligible. I encourage you to go out to the michigan.gov website for more details and to see all of their available programs. Lastly, I would really like to take some time and highlight the importance of searching for scholarships within local community groups, websites, and the other resources listed. Every year, dozens of scholarships from local organizations or even national scholarships go unawarded because students don't apply. Ask your high school counselors or reach out to any community organizations you're a part of to see if they offer scholarships. There may also be a scholarship available to you via your employer as well. There are also many search engines online that will help you identify scholarship opportunities. The one thing I would caution though is that you should never have to pay to apply for a scholarship. Shifting gears before we move on to work study, I wanna take a minute to talk about um, promise zones. Promise zones in Michigan are an opportunity to help pay for college for students if they graduate from a promise zone high school and meet the zones criteria. On this slide, I've listed some promise zones which are affiliated with Baker College. If you're a part of one of these communities, I encourage you to reach out to them and see if you're eligible for aid. If you're curious if you live in a promise zone, you can find more information at the website listed on the slide. Another form of aid is work study. These are funds that are earned from working either an on or off campus jobs. Sometimes federal work study is referred to as self-help aid because you are paid an hourly rate just like you would any other job. The earnings from federal work study are then either paid to you via a paycheck or they get applied towards your balance at the college. In order to qualify for federal work study, the student must be attending classes, except for periods of non-enrollment, such as summer break or winter break. The federal work study also requires that the student have a need based on the FAFSA application, and all colleges will handle federal work study differently. Some award it to the student, expecting them to find a job via their job postings, and others don't award it but post jobs, and if the student's interested, they determine if they're eligible. If you're interested in work study, be sure to understand how each college handles the process. Work study is a great opportunity to gain work experience. Typically, students enter into these, these positions with the employer having the understanding that they need to work around the student's schedule. Work study is a great way to make connections, build a reference list, earn money, and learn life skills. We've now talked about grants, scholarship, and work study. Let's take a few minutes and also discuss student loans. We always like to start this section by advising that loans should always be a last resort option. Explore all the other options, including payment plans, before turning to loans. The less debt you can incur, the better. That being said, the Federal Direct Stafford Loan Program is a nice program for those who need to borrow. Students who borrow are building credit on debt that doesn't need to be repaid right away. The Federal Direct Stafford Loan Program offers two types of loans to student borrowers. By completing the FAFSA, that's what makes students eligible to borrow from Federal Direct Loans, so long as they meet other eligible student criteria. With both types of loans, the student is the borrower, no cosigner or credit is needed. 
repayment on both loan types begins six months after graduation or the student stops attending at least half time. Federal direct subsidized loan, as on the left, is based on having financial need that's determined by the FAFSA. Subsidized loans are interest-free while the student is in school. While we have federal direct unsubsidized loans on the right, which are not dependent on need, unsubsidized loans accrue interest while the student is in school. While it's not required that the interest be paid, we do recommend paying the interest while in school if you're able to, to keep your debt as minimal as possible. While the interest rates on these loans are fixed each year, they do change yearly based on the treasury bill. The interest rates for the 23-24 academic year is set at 5.5%. The amount of money that a student can borrow from a federal student loan is capped each academic year. As you can see from this slide, dependent freshmen are capped at $5,500 for the year. However, independent freshmen are capped at $9,500. This is to help them with more living expenses since they may have dependents to care for while attending college. Both dollar amounts do increase slightly as the student progresses through their education. In total, a dependent student can borrow no more than $31,000, and an independent student can borrow no more than $57,500. We will get into more detail on who is a dependent and who is an independent student when we discuss the FAFSA in later slides. If the amounts the student can borrow is not enough to cover costs, there are private loan options available through private lenders. Oftentimes, the private loans do require co-signers. There are many different private loan lenders who will offer different loan products, so be sure to do your research before deciding on private loans. There is one final federal loan option available to help cover college costs for dependent students. This option is called the Federal Direct Parent Plus Loan. The key word for this loan is the word parent. The Parent Plus Loan is a, is a loan that the parent, not the student, is responsible for repaying. The Plus Loan is credit-based, but parents are typically only denied if they have poor credit history. Income and debt are not in consideration in the Plus Loan approval process. The amount the parent can borrow is dependent on the school's cost of attendance and other aid that the student has received. Repayment of the Parent PLUS loan does begin while the student is in college, but the parent could defer these payments until graduation or the student stops attending at least half time. The parent would need to work with the lender to defer payments. If the option to defer payments is selected, we do still encourage the payment, we do still encourage the parent to pay the interest while the student is in college. In 23-24, Parent PLUS loans have an interest rate of 8.05%. Schools will have different Parent PLUS loan processes. If you need to borrow a Parent PLUS loan, please be sure to consult with the school on their process. Many schools uh, direct students to studentaid.gov to apply for Parent PLUS loans. Let's talk about what exactly the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA, is. The FAFSA is a tool typically completed online at studentaid.gov that collects demographic and financial information used to determine a student's eligibility for financial aid. When completing the FAFSA, the student lists which colleges they want the results released to. Up to 20 colleges can be listed on the FAFSA. As I mentioned before, if you're a Michigan resident, the first school listed on the FAFSA is where the state of Michigan is planning to send any state funding, if you're planning to attend an in-state college. 
If you end up not attending that college, make sure to change your college choice with the state of Michigan via their MySSG portal. Demographic information, such as legal name, social security number, address, and date of birth will be requested for both the student and parents if applicable. Later in this presentation, we will cover when parental information is needed on the FAFSA. In addition to demographic information, 22 tax information will be used to complete the 2024-2025 FAFSA. There are some general eligibility requirements that must be met in order for a student to be eligible for financial aid. Students must be U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Students must have completed their high school or obtained a GED, and students cannot be in default on federal student loans. Regardless of income, all students meeting the eligibility criteria will qualify for some form of financial aid, which includes grants and loans. Therefore, we recommend that everyone complete the FAFSA. Also, the FAFSA is an annual application, so you'll need to complete it every year while you're attending college. Upon submission of the FAFSA, a Student Aid Index, or SAI, is calculated. The SAI is a result of the formula that the federal government uses to determine a family's eligibility to pay. The SAI will remain the same at all schools and will be used to determine how much need-based versus non-need-based aid will be offered to the student. While many people think that need-based aid is just the Pell Grant, that is untrue. The amount of need-based aid a person could qualify for varies based on the school's cost of attendance. Other, form of, other forms of need-based aid include some state grants, work study, and subsidized student loans, as we've mentioned previously. Ultimately, the schools will use the SAI from the FAFSA to determine what types of financial aid they can offer a student. Here is just a general overview of the FAFSA application process steps. The U.S. Department of Education anticipates completing the FAFSA will take approximately one hour. We will go through each of these steps in more detail through the presentation, so let's go through it. Step one is creating your FSA ID. This is your login for the FAFSA application, and you will have to use your social security number to make this account. I recommend that you keep the account credentials secure. Step two will be determining who is a contributor. Contributors are people who are required to supply information to a student's FAFSA application. This can include a parent or a spouse. Step three, collect information for contributors. If you need contributors on your FAFSA, they will need to make their own FSA IDs. Again, the same rules apply to make this account. Step four, completing the FAFSA. The student will complete their portion of the FAFSA and invite contributors to submit their information on the FAFSA application. Step five, contributors complete the, the FAFSA. Contributors will receive the invitation email and put their information in to complete their portion. Step six, review the results. Once the student and all contributors have completed their section, the FAFSA will be submitted. Step seven, watch for communication from schools. They will contact you on more details on verification or other processes that may need to be completed before awarding your aid, or they may have an offer ready for you to review and accept. Now that we have a good general overview, let's get into the details of each step. One of the most important items that will be needed to complete the FAFSA is a federal student ID or FSA ID. Both the student and any contributors will need an FSA ID. Parents, if you already have an FSA ID that you've used to complete the FAFSA for yourself or another child, you do not need to create a new one. The FSA ID you already have assigned to you will work. If the student and or parent doesn't have an FSA ID, please create one right away at studentaid.gov. New for the 24-25 FAFSA, an FSA ID will be required for anyone that is asked to provide information on a student's FAFSA application. If parents filed separately, for example, 
then each parent will need their own FSA ID. Or for an independent student, if you and your spouse filed separately in 2022, then the student spouse will also need an FSA ID. Please keep in mind that the FSA ID is the signature associated with this person's information entered to create the ID. Do not create the ID for someone else. Students should create their ID and a parent will create a separate ID for themselves. Provide answers to the verification questions that you will remember should you ever forget your FSA ID and you need to remember it. When submitting the FSA ID, make sure you correctly enter your social security number, name, and date of birth. These must match what's on your social security card. If one of these data elements doesn't match, it means the ID becomes invalidated. Additionally, each FSA ID must have a unique email address. Do not use a temporary email, such as your high school or college email address. Link the FSA ID to a permanent personal email address. And finally, don't forget your FSA ID. This is the only account you will ever create and will be used for your first FAFSA submission all the way through loan repayment. Unlike other websites, you will never be able to create a second account because your FSA ID is linked to your social security number. Here's a screenshot from studentaid.gov um, on creating an FSA ID. Creating an FSA ID requires the creation of a username and password. When you begin creating the username and password, avoid using personal identifiers, for example, last name or date of birth. The username must also be six to eight characters long. You can use any combination of numbers and or letters, and the username is not case sensitive. Your password must be eight to 30 characters long and contain one or more numbers, one or more uppercase letters, and one or more lowercase letters. Your password is case sensitive. Choose a username and password that you can remember, but will be hard for others to guess. You will be asked to pair a second authentication method to your account, like sending a secure code via email or text, or even the option to set up an authenticator app. As I mentioned previously, contributors such as parents and spouses will need their own separate FSA IDs to complete their portion of the FAFSA application. If they are required to contribute, I strongly encourage making an FSA ID if you have not already and keeping it in a safe place so it's ready for each year when you need to apply. Having the FSA IDs prior to completing the FAFSA will save you both time and frustration, so make sure to get yours today. Okay, so you have your FSA IDs and you're on studentaid.gov. Under the Apply for Aid section, you will click on Complete the FAFSA form. If the students never completed a FAFSA before, they will use Start a New Form. If you are looking to start college in the fall of 2024, then you will need to complete the 24-25 FAFSA application. One thing to point out before we dive deeper into filling out the FAFSA is that every FAFSA user's experience is going to be slightly different. The FAFSA has skip logic built in and it only asks you the questions that pertain to your family's situation. Each answer you provide determines the future questions that you will need to answer. In order for schools to determine what financial aid you may qualify for, they will need to have access to your FAFSA information. You determine which schools receive that information by adding them to your FAFSA. Every school has a federal school code. Baker College's federal school code is 004673. You can list up to 20 schools on your FAFSA with the initial submission, but we recommend only listing those schools that you have a genuine interest in attending. If you change your mind, you can always correct your FAFSA to add or change school codes. Just another reminder, the first school listed on your FAFSA is where the state of Michigan assumes you're going to attend. If it is a Michigan school, that is where the state will plan to attend, uh, plan to send, sorry, any state grants and scholarships. 
If you decide to attend a different school than what you originally listed as the number one school on your FAFSA, you will need to update your choice via the My SSG portal. A common question we get when students are applying for aid is whether or not they need to include parental information on the FAFSA. There are 13 questions on the FAFSA that determine whether a student is dependent or independent. If the student can answer yes to any one of these questions, they are considered independent. On this slide, I'm highlighting six of the most common ways which a student can be independent and not need to include parental information. You will notice on this slide, it doesn't ask whether or not the student is living on their own or self-supporting. Typically, these students are considered dependent and will need to include parental information until they are 24 years old or married or supporting a dependent more than 50% financially. There can be other unique situations that may warrant an otherwise dependent student to be term determined as independent. If there is documented abuse or neglect, financial aid offices can use professional judgment to perform a dependency override. If you are unable to answer yes to any dependency questions and you have a unique situation, contact the financial aid office at the college you plan to attend to see your options. As I've mentioned, new for the 24-25 FAFSA and beyond is the addition of contributors to a student's FAFSA. A contributor refers to anyone who is required to provide their financial information on the FAFSA application based on the student's dependency status or their marital status and tax filing status. The FAFSA application will let you know whose information you need. Everyone's situation will be different, if contributors do not complete their portion in 45 days after the student's request, then the FAFSA form will be deleted. Let's go through some scenarios. If a dependent student has parents that are divorced or separated, then the student will have their parent that provided the most financial support in the last 12 months be a contributor. Let's say we have a high school senior that is dependent on the FAFSA and both parents are married. If the parents filed taxes in 2022 as married filing jointly, then they will have only one parent that will contribute on the application. However, let's say the parents filed as single that year or married filing separately, then they will have to have both parents be contributors on the FAFSA. Looking at an independent student, Let's say an independent student filed 2022 taxes with their spouse as married joint. Then only the student will need to be a contributor. But let's say that the independent student got married in 2023 and completed taxes in 2022 as single and their spouse did as well. Then the student and the spouse will have to report information on the FAFSA application. As I've said, this is a new process for 2024-2025, so please call if you have questions on who to report. And as I've said, the FAFSA will also walk you through who you need to have as a contributor as well. Now that we have a better understanding of what which parent or contributor may be asked on the FAFSA, let's take a look at what information will be added to the student's FAFSA application. The student will be asked to provide the contributor's identifiers, including first and last name, date of birth, social security number, and an email address for the contributor request to be sent to. The contributor will then get an email invite for them to log in and complete their section of the FAFSA application. Please note that the parent's marital status is whatever their status is the day they completed the FAFSA, not what is on the taxes. The contributor will be presented to accept or decline the student's invitation to their FAFSA form. Please note that if the parent declines the invitation or if any contributors decline the invitation, the student will not be eligible for federal Pell Grants or subsidized student loans. They will only be eligible for unsubsidized loans. 
By contributing to a student's FAFSA, you are not automatically on the hook to pay for your student's education. You're just helping them see what they could be eligible for. Another change to the 24-25 FAFSA is the addition of the Future Act Direct Data Exchange tool known as FADDX. The Future Act was passed, which calls for the FAFSA to be simplified and allow the direct transfer from an individual's tax data on file with the IRS to be directly transferred to the FAFSA application. This eliminates the need for manual entry of tax and income information and makes the application process much quicker and easier. Because this is a lot of income information coming over between systems, students and contributors will have to provide their consent to the FAFSA individually. While the FADDX system will transfer over your tax information, it will not transfer over any information regarding the student and contributor's assets. Remember, answer the questions as they are presented. Report answers individually for both the student and the parents. The first one should be easy. It is how much cash checking and savings accounts. The second question about investment often leads questions for families. So let's talk about what to include first. You would include real estate that is not the home you live in. Any rental properties would be an investment. Other investments include trust funds, UGMA or UTMA accounts, money market funds, mutual funds, CDs, stocks, stock options, bonds, other securities, installment and land sale contracts, and commodities. 529 college savings plans also get reported, but who owns the fund determines how it gets reported. Be sure to read the student investment and parent investment links on the questions for more details. Also keep in mind that you report the net worth of these investments. So if you have a rental property that has a value of 100,000, but the mortgage is for 90,000, then the net worth is only 10,000. Now let me clear up what is not an investment. Your primary residence that you live in is not an investment that needs to be reported. You also do not need to include the value of life insurance, retirement plans such as 401k and 403b, pension funds, annuity, non-education IRAs, or KEO plans. I wanna make sure that I'm clear that you do not include your primary residence or retirement and pension funds. And then moving on to our last asset question about businesses and farms. If you and your family have any businesses or farms, you'll wanna put the net worth of that in this question. When I introduced the FAFSA to you, the first word I used was free. You will never have to pay to complete the FAFSA. Be sure to use the studentaid.gov website. If you are on a site that's asking for a payment, then you are on the wrong site to submit the FAFSA. The FAFSA must be submitted every year beginning October 1st for the upcoming school year. So, 2024 seniors, now is the time to do your FAFSA for the 24-25 academic year. If there are any juniors watching or those looking to attend college in the fall of 2025 and the spring of 2026, then you will have to submit your FAFSA and you'll have to wait um, to do that until October 1st, 2024, when the 2526 form is available. This form in the future will look at 2023 tax information. The 24-25 FAFSA is set to release in December 23 and will use 2022 income information. So there's no reason to wait to complete the FAFSA when it is made available. Some forms of financial aid are awarded on a first come first serve basis. So I encourage you to get the FAFSA done right away as soon as it launches. Now that we've covered the FAFSA application, Let's take a look at the next steps at a college that gets your FAFSA results.
All right, you did it. The FAFSA has been completed. But remember, you're likely not done with the financial aid process. Be sure to review your FAFSA submission summary, or FSS, which you should have received via email once the FAFSA is submitted. If there's a problem or you need to make a correction, return to studentaid.gov to make any necessary updates. Additionally, your schools may ask for more information. 30% of all applicants are randomly selected for a process called verification. And you may need to turn in additional information to substantiate what was reported on the FAFSA. Be sure you know how your college is going to communicate with you, whether it's via your personal email, maybe you're assigned a college email address, a portal, or postal mail. At Baker College, we communicate via a college assigned email address, a portal, and US postal mail. One thing I want you to make sure you get is your financial aid offer. The financial aid offer will tell you what types of financial aid you may qualify for at each of the schools where you were sent your FAFSA results. Again, you will want to know at the school you are going to, how they're going to communicate with you and what you will need to do once the financial aid offer is received. Schools handle financial aid funds differently. For example, Baker College gives students the option to accept, decline, or ask for a reduction in loan amounts. Some schools may award federal work study as part of an aid package and expect the student to find an on-campus um, job as a way to pay for their tuition. The point here is to make sure you understand your financial aid offer and to ask questions to the financial aid office if you don't. One final point to make is that we understand family situations change and job loss has been and continues to be a very real thing. If your family's income has changed significantly since 2022, please talk with your financial aid office. We have the ability to perform professional judgment and we can change FAFSA data elements to better reflect your family's current, abil uh, current ability to pay. Let's take a look at some scenarios on how aid is applied to a student's cost of attendance. Each college is going to calculate a different cost of attendance based on their housing charges, where they're located, and how much their tuition costs. These examples look at Baker specifically, so I want to make sure you check your college for the most accurate information. Let's start with student A. Student A has three people in their household an income from 2022 of $35,000 and a high school GPA between 2.5 and 2.99. Student A completed the FAFSA application and we were able to award them their eligible aid. So you can see the full Pell is listed on the slide. You can see at the top next to the red arrow that the charges for the fall and spring semesters come to $18,000. This is what Baker is charging the student for housing and tuition for their program. Because they qualify for the maximum Pell and other grants and scholarships offered, this student has nothing due out of pocket. But wait, what happens to the excess aid that wasn't used? Depending on the source and the rules for each program, the student may receive a refund and be able to use those funds to buy books, supplies, or any other school-related expenses. Now let's take a look at student B. They have a three-person household, an income from 2022 of $100,000, and a high school GPA between 3 and 3.49. Their charges are the same as student A but because of their eligibility for the, from the FAFSA, they aren't eligible for the same scholarships and grants as student A. This is to show that each student is different. After applying all the scholarships that the student qualifies for, there is a balance for the spring and fall semester. So this is where outside scholarships, federal loans, or work study can help come in to help the student pay off the balance. And lastly, we have student C. They have a household size of three, an income reported from 2022 of $130,000, and a high school GPA of a 3.5 or higher. 
like student B, they have a balance as well after all gift aid is applied. But you can see that the household incomes between B and C are different, yet they are still eligible for the same amount of aid. This goes to show you that you never know what you could be eligible for. I've heard so many families and students say they will not complete the FAFSA because they don't qualify for anything. As you can see through these examples, it doesn't hurt to try and submit a FAFSA. The results may surprise you. We went through some examples of students and how aid can be different based on household size and other factors. That gave you an idea of how aid may look at Baker, but what about other colleges and their financial aid offers? You may receive from another private college a $20,000 scholarship and think you are all set, woohoo! But then you take a look at their tuition cost of $50,000 and you end up with a balance to cover with other aid of $30,000 or a public university. You may be offered a $4,000 scholarship, but still have to come up with the financing for the remaining balance. It's a good idea to compare all college and award letters to get the best deal for you. You'll hear it time and time again that college is an investment, but taking the time to look at all these facts can help you save in the long run. I wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation and to think about financial aid in the FAFSA. Please remember that regardless of where you're considering going to school, we are here to help you. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us should you have any specific questions when completing the FAFSA or general questions about financial aid. Best of luck as you venture into the next phase of your life. Thank you.